good party, right? Uh, everybody loves a good party. <laughs> okay. Um, I love the idea of a good party. Um, uh, and, and there are a few that I can recall that, that are like, that was good. I enjoyed that. Um, pool parties, uh, party at the lake. Uh, the idea of hanging out with friends, you know, laughter, joy, right? Those are, I think those are, are good things. I think those are things. Um, but, but often I feel like a fish out of water when it comes to parties. I, I remember, you know, in college when some of my peers in the music department at Humber College had hosted a party and I was invited to come and participate it, in it and I showed up and I mean, I grew up teetotal um, and, and never consumed, you know, much alcohol. And, and you know, here I'm in this situation that I'm, I'm just frankly uncomfortable in, not quite sure how to interact. I, I, don't, I don't feel like I do well with small talk. Uh, you know, that, that you just, like, I'd love to have, you know, kind of a more meaningful conversation, you know, get to know you a little bit better. Um, how do you get into those conversations? I, I, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall with Jesus who seemed to be able to navigate those waters really, really well. Um, and, and just be able to find his way into places of, of meaning. Uh, Jesus seemed to love uh, a, a good party and, and used it to his full advantage. Um, Yahweh, um, Father God, loves a good party. I'm going to use the word Yahweh, um, the name Yahweh this morning, as, a, as something more specific than just referring to God. God means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, but Yahweh is the, is the name that God revealed of himself to Moses, Exodus chapter 3, um, uh, meaning the, he, he, when Moses said, uh, if I go back to the people in Egypt and I tell them who sent me, um, uh, who do I say he sent me? And, and he said, I am that I am. Tell them that the I am has sent you. The Hebrew word there is Yahweh, as best we can kind of phonetically spell it out. Um, mispronounced for years as Jehovah. Um, so so I'm, when, I, when I'm using that, that's, I just thought it was important for you to understand that. Um, Yahweh seems to love parties. There, there were three feasts that he called his his people to observe uh, every year. Um, th this is going to be a bit of a long introduction to get to the text. Kevin prayed out of John chapter 7. We're going there this morning, uh, but there's some introduction that's necessary if you're to understand the context of, of what took place, what the things are that Jesus said. Uh, God, loved a good, God loved a good party, three feasts each year. The, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, were called to come to Jerusalem in order to celebrate Passover. Uh, we're just a few weeks from Easter. Um, it took place in the spring, um, and uh, the, Easter, the first Easter weekend took place around the Passover celebrations in ancient Israel. Seven weeks later was Pentecost. Uh, we're we're going to observe Pentecost. We're going to anticipate Pentecost and, and all that it means. And, and then the third feast, so Passover, Pentecost, and the third feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, that took place in the fall uh, of the year. Um, it was sometimes called the Festival of Ingathering because it, uh, it was a celebration of uh, the harvest that had been brought and, uh, and, and gratitude for, to God for that, for the increases in the crops, the increases in the herd, um, and an and anticipation, an intercession for the next year of crops and, and all that would be sought there. Um, the Festival of Ingathering, the Festival of Tabernacles, also called the, the Festival of Booths, or the Feast of Booths. Uh, it involved remembering Israel's wanderings in the wilderness. And, and it really kind of boiled down to this. It was a celebration of God's presence and his provision. Um, it, it was an invitation to come and with joy, uh, engage in celebration together, uh, party together, worship together um, at tabernacles. Uh, one rabbi uh, is recorded to have said, he who has not seen tabernacles has not seen joy. So, so this was what was anticipated. It was seven days of worship and celebration and community gathering together um, with an eighth day added on just for good measure. Um, it was like a sanctified stampede. Uh, like it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, a, everybody participated. 
Uh, Tabernacles, as I said, happened in the fall, September, October. Uh, Those who were with me in Israel in September, we were there for uh, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, which then is followed by uh, the festival, the Feast of of Tabernacles. Um, uh, Yom Kippur um, uh, was nothing like what I anticipated it would to be. It was nothing, and even the Feast of Booths was nothing like what the historians tell us was really part of uh, the original intent of tabernacles. Uh, The streets were deserted, uh, on on Yom Kippur in particular. Uh, The the ultra-Orthodox would kind of beeline to their places of of destination with with a somberness of of heart and and a dourness of expression. Uh, The eve of Yom Kippur uh, is the night of solemn pleading to God uh, concerning sin. The difficulty is that they have no way of, of knowing have their intercessions been, been responded to. Is there forgiveness of sin? You and I know, yes, of course, because the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has come among us, but this would be the situation. So it, in Jesus' day, Tabernacles was celebration. It was, it was a street party like you can't imagine. It was joy, it was music, it was singing, it was dancing. It, it was a festival of light. The scholars tell us that there was, would be erected four pillars in the court of, uh, of the women uh, on the Temple Mount uh, that would be fueled with about 100 liters of oil each, and, and the uh, robes from the priests, uh, the, the, the old robes from the priests' garments would be used as wicks to light literally the city, like it, in a dark world where you had no city street lights, nothing like that. All of a sudden, there was these, the seven, eight day period of time when there was light. And it was a joyful, it invited, it invited hope, uh, it invited um, uh, an invitation to extend the party, you know, into the evening. Uh, so we have, we have it, it was the context, of course, of the days getting shorter, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and so light dispelling darkness, uh, anticipation of, of God. It was looking back to uh, the, the experience in the wilderness uh, when God was present to the children of Israel and led them by a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. It was light, it was celebration. Um, but the joy and the singing and the celebration and the light, uh, these were all byproducts of the heart of what Tabernacles was all about. And, and I've said it already, it was about Yahweh dwelling with those who believe. Uh, this is where we're gonna go this morning. We're gonna talk about his lingering with us, his dwelling with us. Yahweh dwells with those. This is the outline on your sermon notes if you have them. Uh, he, he teaches those who will listen. And he provides for those who will receive. So Yahweh dwells with those who believe. Um, uh, so the origins for, for the Feast of Tabernacles take us back to early Israel and the exodus out of Egypt. Um, and so by uh, instating the, the expectation of tabernacles, uh, God was inviting his people to remember what he had provided for them in bringing them out of slavery in Egypt into the wilderness, and then he was present to them. Cloud by day, fire by night. Uh, they, they dwelt in tents. They dwelt in temporary dwelling places through that period of time. And kind of... and. and, and and God was, was there for them in provision. And so by remembering, by going, so, so literally, uh, the children of Israel, through that period of time, when they were faithful in observing the feast, uh, they would set up booths or tents and then live in them for those seven days. Seven day camp out, uh, the early origins. They would camp out in the fields with the, uh, with the livestock. Uh, city, city dwellers, not so much, right? Um, uh, today, uh, booths, you'd see booths built on the uh, balconies. Of, uh, of some of the homes that were observant Jews celebrating as we went through the streets of Jerusalem. Seventy camp out. Uh, they survived 40 years, 38 years in the wilderness, wilderness wanderings, and God was present to them. Here's a picture of a booth, probably a modern day booth, um, really set up for, I would say set up for dinner as opposed to set up for camping out. <laughs> but uh, part of the celebrations as they are observed today, so the candles reminding them that God led them through the wilderness, uh, the tabernacles reminding them of the, the way God provided for them even when they were living in, in humble dwelling places. But at the heart was God's presence to Israel, even through the most, her most difficult days. 
and therefore we will worship him. Uh, We will celebrate him with joy. We will say God is the one who is present to us and he's the one who has provided for us. So that is a big long introduction to set up John chapter seven, which begins in the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, It's on the screen here, or if you wanna look it up in your, uh, if you're using a digital device, um, I'm in the New International Version of this morning. John chapter seven, I'm just gonna read the first 13 verses to start. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. Maybe I should remind you after this, um, uh, feeding the 5,000, that was chapter six, uh, walking on water, chapter six, uh, back in Capernaum, uh, chapter six, how did you get here? Um, uh, That was all part of of what was going on. Uh, Contest, uh, argument with uh, the leaders there, chapter six, that's gonna become part of every chapter that we're in now. Um, here we go, after this, after, after that. Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tab- tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For... Even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Around the crowds, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. So this is what John wants us to know about the, 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 the setup uh, for where he's, what he's gonna teach us as we work our way through this portion of his gospel. Uh, the, the setting is the Festival of Tabernacles. We've talked about what that is and what it, it symbolizes. Uh, Jesus' brothers were mocking him. They don't believe him. He responds to that mockery with the same language that he used to his mother just a few chapters ago in the Can- uh, in, at the, the wedding in Cana uh, where he said, my time has not yet come. This word time, or his hour, we're going to see that, uh, we've seen it already, we'll see it again in the gospel, is referring to that window of time when Jesus will finally and completely finish all that he had been assigned to do by the Father. It was yet before him. You and I have read ahead. We know all of this is leading to the cross. Um, And and increasingly, we're going to get this sense that nothing is going to get in the way of Jesus' agenda toward the cross. In fact, he alone will set his agenda. Uh, No one is going to rush him. No one's going to get in his way. Those who want to kill him, he's going to avoid them. And then he will die exactly as he intends to die. At the Passover, when all the other lambs that have foreshadowed him He, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, will surrender his life. It's all unfolding according to his plan. Now, as we read, the crowds were divided. He's a good man. Others say he deceives. Everyone is afraid of the leadership. Everyone's trying to keep it on the down low and and not get somehow caught in the crosshairs of, of people that increasingly were realizing have evil hearts. Do not... They're the, they're the, they were the first ones who ought to have recognized the Messiah, and yet they seem to be the last who do. Now, it's also important that we catch some irony here that John has set up for us. So here we have Jesus coming to the Festival of Tabernacles, which celebrates Yahweh, God, tabernacling with his people. The word tabernacle means to dwell. So God, Yahweh, we're celebrating. He came, he dwelt among us, he tabernacled with us. And and you remember back in chapter one, uh, the Gospel of John, we read this. The word became flesh, verse 14, and tabernacled among us, made his dwelling 
among us. So catch the irony here. The one who is God's presence among us, Jesus, has arrived at the festival intended to celebrate God's presence among us, and Jesus has come secretly to it. He wasn't going to be forced by the agenda of his brothers. He wasn't going to go up on their terms. He would come on his own terms, in the way that he alone intended. So so Yahweh dwells with those who believe, and for centuries the, the Jewish people hoped and dreamed that it would be true again. And now among them is Jesus. And so few are recognizing him. Uh, Yahweh teaches those who will listen. This is one of the things we come to expect through the pages of the Old Testament. He's present, he provides, but he also teaches, he instructs. Let's just read these next few verses, uh, starting at verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. It's kind of interesting that John then doesn't go on to say, and here's what Jesus was teaching. What he does instead is he actually tells us about the quarrel that takes place between Jesus and these leaders, but in that, you and I are supposed to learn, okay? Um, What what did we learn? Uh, Well, well, verse 17, uh, we we learn that Jesus' teaching comes from God. My teaching's not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Now, I haven't read it all. It's pretty long. Um, Verses 21 through 24 make it clear that Jesus has authority and it's okay for him to heal on the Sabbath. We talked a bit about that last Sunday. Part of the the challenge, part of the, uh, Jesus has healed a man on the Sabbath and that becomes an offense uh, to the, uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders of the day. How dare you? The law says you can't. We have said you can't. This is not okay. And Jesus, in those few verses, argues this. The the intent of the law is that we would ultimately do good. He uses the example of circumcising a boy born on the eighth day was to be the circumcision that fell on a Sabbath. Well, you would work because there was a higher principle at work here. Uh, Surely, surely healing someone uh, in need uh, fits into that higher principle that, that, that is there. And we begin to say, isn't that fascinating? Um, there are some priorities here. And the, the heart of the law, the intent of the law, must be attended to, and not just the letter of the law. Jesus teaches, his teaching comes from God, verse 17. Jesus can heal someone on the Sabbath, verses 21 through 24. Uh, verse 28, Jesus is exercising the Father's authority. He's no renegade. This is not, you know, Jesus gone wild. Um, And again, again, John wants us to see there's this intimate connection between Jesus and the Father, the Father and the Son. We're increasingly recognizing this this mystery that is present in the pages of Scripture. There is one God, and and he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've been seeing the Son sometimes doing man stuff. He's hungry, he's thirsty, he needs, he's tired, he needs to rest. He is fully human. And sometimes we see him doing God stuff, the things that God alone can do, and we're forced to this conclusion. He is fully God. He is Yahweh among us. And here he's come to the Feast of Tabernacles. The presence is being celebrated. And here is the presence himself walking among us. Yahweh dwells with those who believe. I'd encourage you in that last little bit. Read those verses that we've not read together this morning. Maybe read it this afternoon. Secondly, Yahweh teaches those who will listen. And then third, Yahweh provides for those who will receive. 
So as I said, the Festival of Tabernacles ran seven days uh, with that additional day on the end. Uh, This was about celebration and worship and rest. And maybe even knowing this is kind of, if nothing else, it's curious, interesting in this sense, because here's just a contemporary um, orientation, a little contemporary orientation for you. As, as I was saying, we were there in September. There were 10 of us from our church, 13 of us traveling together in particular. Uh, as we worked our way through Israel and, and just had a fabulous time together, um, we were in Jerusalem for Yom Kippur and everything was shut down for 48, day, uh, 48 hours because it was the 50th anniversary of uh, the, the Yom Kippur War. 1974, Yom Kippur in Israel was a little bit like Christmas for us. Like, everybody wants the day off. So the uh, Israeli Defense Force had sent, you know, as many of, you know, their troops home as they could to celebrate Yom Kippur with their families. And in that gap, uh, Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack back in 1973. and, and they, it almost devastated Israel. Um, and it was funny, our, our tour guide said, uh, you Christians, you celebrate the good things, you celebrate God's provision at Thanksgiving and his coming at Christmas and his gift of life at, at Easter. He says, we Israelis, we celebrate, we survived. They attacked us, we survived. They beat on us, we survived. It was hilarious. Um, uh, what we experienced there was, was very different. Uh, Yom Kippur came and went, 50th anniversary, uh, no issues. Um, and, and then on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Hamas attacked. And it's like, somebody's looking at the calendar, somebody's paying attention to some of this stuff. And, and, and the horrible you know, bloodshed that has followed. I mean, there, there's no good side on this. I'm not taking sides. It's, it's wretched uh, what's taking place there. We need to pray for, uh, for peace in Israel. I, I thought maybe a little bit of contemporary orientation is helpful. These, these things continue to reverberate through history. Um, understanding, you know, these, these Old Testament accounts and, and then how Jesus applied them and, and inserted himself into them. It, it's not just fluff and stuff. Um, so, so the festival, it was, it was supposed to be about, it was about in that day, joy and singing and celebration. It was about light uh, and these were a byproduct of the fact that God himself was with them in the wilderness, uh, in the exodus, uh, as he had led them out of slavery in Egypt. The festival was about all of those things. It was also about water, or at least water played a significant role in the celebration of the festival. Each day of the festival, there would be a priestly procession uh, that would go from the Temple Mount down to the Pool of Siloam. And, and they would, here's a picture of the Pool of Siloam, by the way. That's kind of a contemporary excavation there. Um, uh, the, uh, the Gihon Spring fed into the Pool of Siloam, and then Hezekiah's Tunnel fed from there into the city, and it was a bit of a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, um, a reservoir for water for the city. If they were under siege or, or that kind of thing, it was, was part of their defense strategy. Um, and Water would be scooped up from here, about three liters of water, and would be processed back up to the Temple Mount, and then poured out in ceremony on the, the corner of the altar. And, and there were several things that were going on here, a couple of things at least. One was by pouring the water out kind of back into the belly of the earth, there was some symbolism attached to this, a kind of a physical act with spiritual overtones. Um, this was an act of prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you for your provision. Remember, this is the Feast of Ingathering. Thank you for your provision. And we are trusting you to be the one who will water the earth and will provide next year's harvest. So, so it is a physical act with spiritual overtones uh, that um, uh, was, was an act of intercession on behalf of the nation. Um, it was also an anticipation of the fulfillment of, of the prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 47. Uh, maybe you've read that, maybe you're familiar with that, uh, but the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel um, said that the day would come uh, when water would trickle out from the south side of the temple, and it would become a river of life flowing down through the Arabah, through the the Dead Sea. Um, uh, He said it would be, initially it would be ankle deep, and then knee deep, and then waist deep, and then deep enough to swim in. And the promise, the anticipation was it would be teeming with life, fish, food, uh, that there would be trees growing along the banks uh, of the river uh, with, with fruit that, that would be for the provision of the people and, and leaves that would be for healing. 
John picks this up in the Revelation, in, in the book of Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter 22. Um, so so this, is, this is what's taking place here. There's this, this anticipation in the midst of the joy, um, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, joy, celebrating, feasting, spectacular light, this great water drawing that has happened. And, and this is then the setting. Some have suggested uh, that it may have been when the candles were extinguished. Don't know if that's true or not. But this is what happened next. John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone who is thirsty, if anyone who is thirsty, <laughs> let me read it properly, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. On the last and greatest day of the feast, now probably that was day seven. Some think it was day eight. We don't know for sure. Probably day seven. But it's this, it's this climax of the joyous celebration that, that's marked God's presence to his people, his provision for his people. He, he dwelt with them in the wilderness. He provided for them. He's provided for them in the contemporary and the current harvest that they've enjoyed. And they're praying and anticipating the harvest to come. Uh, he, he was with the people in the wilderness. Uh, how, do you recall how he provided for the, the, the people in the wilderness, the children of Israel in the wilderness? What was it he provided for them? Manna. It was a kind of bread that he provided uh, for them. What did Jesus, just one chapter ago, provide in the wilderness for the, the, the crowd that had gathered? What did he provide? Bread. He, he, he multiplied five barley loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 men, plus women and children. And, and John's inviting us to connect the dots. Yahweh has intercepted this celebration which he's com commissioned, this, this party that he has said do this each year that celebrates his presence, his provision. It's been intercepted by Jesus who is Yahweh among us by John's testimony and by the testimony of many we've been listening to already. He's God with skin on we, and, and we've seen this demonstration of his provision in the wilderness and then he's turned and he said, I am the bread of life. And here now we are praying for uh, water, anticipating harvest, but anticipating a much greater work that Ezekiel prophesies, longing that living water would be there. And Jesus says, come to me and drink. And we recall there was plenty of bread, 12 baskets of leftovers. And he says, if you will come to me and drink, rivers of living water, will flow out of your belly. They poured the water into the belly of the earth. Jesus, now, let, me, let me just do a quick recap here. Just let, remember these things. Carry these things forward, if you would, please. John chapter one, the word was with God. The word was God. We come to understand that's Jesus. He made everything. Nothing was made that hasn't been made that wasn't made through him. In him was life. In him was light. It shines in the darkness. Are you connecting the dots? Do you, do, you, do you hear those threads? Do you see those threads drawing through this? The word became flesh and tabernacles, dwells among us. And in support of these extraordinary claims concerning Jesus, John invites us to hear Jesus pulling together these very awe-inspiring images. The mystery of this, how can this be? The complexity of it, good Lord, this is, oh, it's so much. The mystery and the complexity of who Jesus is. And, and Jesus would stand in the temple, chapter 2, and, and effectively say, I am the temple. My, my body now has become the temple. Destroy it in three days, I will raise it up again. And he says, I am the, the, the living water. He said that in chapter four to the Samaritan woman and, and she believed and her village believed. In chapter six, he says, I am the bread of life. If you will figuratively ingest me, 
you, you will be nourished and will receive eternal life. And, and then he'll say really difficult to understand things like, eat my flesh. And we say, okay, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is purposely moving toward Passover so that he will be executed with the lambs that have foreshadowed who he is and his coming and our need. But, but these, these sacrifices, this was a big barbecue. The aromas must have been fantastic. Like They weren't just burning the meat up to blackened crisp, unless you were a bad barbecuer. Um, but th this was a feast. The, the, these lambs would be consumed. So when Jesus says, eat my flesh, he's referring to that imagery. Like the best barbecue you can ever have because spiritual provision is coming. I am the bread of life. Uh, eat my flesh. I am the lamb of the Passover. I am living water. Come to me and drink. And those who believe in me, out of your innermost being, out of your belly, will come living water. Rivers of living water. Jesus, God among us, Yahweh, dwells with those who believe. Teaches those who will listen. And he provides for those who are willing to receive. Are you willing? Jesus is offering you his presence. He's offering you his provision unto eternal life. Jesus invites you to come and drink deeply of the living water he is offering. Are you thirsty? In verse 38, he'd say this, whoever believes in me, as scriptures has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I want to invite the worship team to come and join me. How do you receive? Like, like, what does that mean? How do I put some traction to that so that it gains some momentum in my life? Let me suggest that, that another metaphor, one thing that is maybe helpful is it's, it's about as simple as breathing. Uh, if we add a bit of spiritual imagery to a very essential and natural physical function, and envision exhaling as, as an act of confession, an act of laying before God those things which have impeded my access to God. I exhale my doubts. I exhale my lack of faith. I exhale my seeming inability to trust him consistently. Whatever has kept me from coming and drinking the living water that he offers, eating the, the, the bread of life that he offers, and then inhale the forgiveness, right? Uh, John, same John, writing in his letter, 1 John, uh, will, will issue this promise. He will say, if, you confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, so I, I exhale. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Here are the things going on in my life. I inhale the forgiveness. And, and I, I begin to, it's just a suggestion. I, I, I can begin to add spiritual meaning to something that is really just a very simple and essential physical uh, something. Uh, Samaritan woman found that when she uh, owned her sin, uh, she was forgiven. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to talk about the woman who was caught in adultery. Uh, again, she's going to illustrate this invitation uh, to life in Jesus. And this Sunday, it needs to be true for you. Uh, I wonder if you'd stand with us. Psychologists tell us that there's actually something physical in, in the breathing exercise that is, is useful. Um, they'll refer to it as uh, square breathing, um, where you yeah, think, count, count, count of four to breathe in. And then hold it for four. And then exhale for four. 
and then hold that emptiness for four. And then inhale for four. We're, we're, we're kind of going around the square. <laughs> uh, and just a physical, a physical something that helps us deal with some of the anxieties. I, I don't know about you, but th- often the thing that gets in the way of my drinking is, uh, is just physical anxiety, mental distraction, physical busyness. We're human beings. Jesus knows that. Um, and he's given us just some fi- very simple physical things that we can begin to conceptualize what it means to eat and drink. So, Colleen, just start us into this, and, and let me just invite you to allow this song to be a prayer. Um, as you would respond to this lyric and say, yes, all who are thirsty. Would you like to sing that with us? All who are, are weak, weak come, come to, to the, the fountain. fountain. Dip your, your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. Himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. And then he promised this. He said, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. It's not all mystery. Um, uh, 
or some of it has just some really practical invitations to feed and, and drink. Uh, we refer to it as this feast uh, that Jesus offers to us and invites us as often as we will to come and partake. It anticipates the feast that will begin all feasts uh, in the end of days and the beginnings of eternity, uh, where Jesus himself is our host. And he says, feed on me. Drink of me. I am present to you. I am providing for you. And this physical act of eating and drinking has spiritual realities attached to it. It's looking back, inviting us to remember, and it's inviting us to look forward in anticipation. And so if you're resolved to follow Jesus, we would invite you to follow him with us. In the taking of this bread, such that we would remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, this is my body given for you. And we take and we eat remembering what he's done for us. Let's eat together. And then he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin, a new covenant being made with you. And we drink remembering what he's done for us. Let's just drink together. Paul tells us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we celebrate the Lord's death until he comes. And so I want to invite you to sing a song of joy, a song of celebration, in response this morning uh, to what he's done. And maybe he's not done. Maybe he's not done. Maybe he's only just begun something. And you want to come and pray with Kevin or Tim or myself, Colin's back there. Uh, We would be delighted to pray with you. Uh, Carla is there. We'd be grateful to pray with you as well.